Introducing journalist, author, and innovative American dreamer, Lee Gallagher. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hello. I want to thank Philadelphia Magazine and Tom McGrath for having me here. It's a real honor to be here today. I am a proud child of Philadelphia. I grew up in media. I went to uh, Strathaven High School. My very first job in the world was as an intern for Philly Mag. So it's really, really special for me to be here today. Um, I'm even a Phillies fan, an Eagles fan, and a Flyers fan behind enemy lines in New York City, where I live now. So uh, anyway, thank you again. Um, I want to start with a quick show of hands. I'd like everybody to raise your hand if you grew up in a suburb. OK, now raise your hand if you live in a suburb today. OK, it's even Stephen a little bit here. Uh, but Philadelphia is unique for reasons we'll talk about. There's a major change happening uh, when it comes to where, where and how we want to live. This is the house I grew up in in Media, Pennsylvania. Um, I, I had a wonderful childhood there. I love it. It's a wonderful place. And yet, a couple months ago, I put out this book called The End of the Suburbs, Where the American Dream is Moving. I did that not because I hate the suburbs. I actually had a wonderful experience there. I did it because we're in the middle of a very pivotal point when it comes to how and where we want to live in this country. And the whole idea and notion of the American suburb, that uniquely American way of life, uh, best embodied by a house, a lawn, a car, a couple kids, um, it no longer holds the central place in our culture the way it once did. And I thought that was a really big change and worthy of writing a book about. So during the past two years, I've been kind of a suburbologist. And during that time, I've spent a lot of time talking to people about their experience in the suburbs today, which tends to be a lot different from the experience I had growing up in the suburbs. So I thought I would start by sharing a little bit of what they told me. I slowly realized it was not the life I wanted to live. That was a mom of four in Boston. We're only here until the kids are done with school. I heard that a lot. This one was funny. Congrats on the book. I live in a sterile, superficial suburb after having lived in Chelsea for 12 years, and I'm dying slowly, one day at a time. <laughs> Talk soon, Rob. <laughs> so how did this happen? How did we get here? This is supposed to be the American dream, something that's aspired to the world over. Answering that question is why I wrote this book. And what I found out, it's not all bad if you live in the suburbs. We're in the middle of this shift that's even transforming our suburbs and making them uh, more urbanized, different kinds of places to live so that it's not going to be just city or suburb when you have to choose where you live. It might, there might be somewhere in between, which is better for everybody. But suffice it to say that big shifts are happening, and it's not overstating things to say that the American dream might one, might one day look more like this or like this. To understand some of these changes, it helps to understand how the suburbs were born and how they got here. Uh, and basically, they were a really great idea when they started. This is Levittown, the famous suburb outside of New York. The suburbs started out as a wonderful place to live, and many still are. This is Radburn, New Jersey. But then they morphed into something else, and that something else is what has stopped working for many people. I like to put it, uh, look at it through the lens of popular culture. And through that lens, you might think of it as the suburbs sort of started out as the ones in the Wonder Years, the television show that had sepia tone memories, kids playing in the streets and everything. And they ended up more like the ones in Weeds, the Showtime series <laughs> about the cookie cutter suburb uh, that's based on the more kind of strip mall plus subdivision model where, as the theme song cheerfully says, everything all looks just the same. That was the model that we chose to supersize and kind of Stepfordize and cut and paste across our landscape. And then it went on steroids during the housing boom. To use another television analogy, the American suburbs have basically jumped the shark. Yeah. So that's led to a number of problems for people that they didn't anticipate. The first of which is long commutes and heavy traffic. Nobody needs a lesson on how this is uh, not fun. But 
3.5 million Americans now commute 90 minutes or more a day each way. I talked to a lot of people about their commuting stories. Here in Philadelphia, I think we're a little bit spoiled. It's not as bad as it is in parts of the Southwest and the West of the country. But I talked to one woman who lived in, uh, worked in Orange County, California, and she and her husband bought a house in Temecula, which is about 62 miles from where she taught. It's considered a commuter town. To get to her class on time, she had to set her alarm for 3.50 in the morning, leave her house at 4 in the morning in her sweatpants, because only at that hour was she guaranteed that it would only take an hour and 15 minutes, but then she'd get to school at 5.15 in the morning. So what would she do? She went back to sleep under her desk in her classroom. She said, I felt like George Costanza from the Seinfeld episode where he goes to sleep under his desk. Um, another problem with this arrangement pattern is that it puts people really far away from each other. I talked to a woman outside of Chicago who lived in a 6,000 square foot mansion, circular driveway, three car garage, the whole deal. And she said that she was struck one day when she suddenly realized that in 10 years she had never set foot in any of her neighbor's kitchens. And that was really kind of very problematic for her. Another, another uh, kind of way this manifests itself is on Halloween in many places, the houses are so far apart that it's not possible for the kids to trick or treat. It's too exhausting, the parents are worried about safety, um, and from a kid's perspective, you just wouldn't get enough candy, there's no way. At densities like that, you know, you'd get five pieces of candy. So there's a neighborhood in New Jersey where the parents decided to park collectively at the K-8 to school, the local area school, uh, park in tailgate formation, and the kids would trick or treat from car to car. So they loved it, it was wonderful. The parents found it to be a very social occasion, the kids loved it, they decorated their cars, but it just goes to show you how far we've come from natural, organic communities that we have to literally build them out of cars. You can see a lot of this dissatisfaction on Twitter, as you can with most things these days. So when you go on Twitter, I was procrastinating when I was writing the book, and I would do this a lot, <laughs> um, and you search for I hate the suburbs, the hashtag, you get a lot of very colorful things, including this Twitter feed from a woman outside of Charlotte, Car uh, North Carolina, it's called cul-de-sac. Um, when you search for I love the suburbs, you get nothing. Every now and then you might get one single tweet, but most of the time you get nothing. So if everybody lives here but nobody's tweeting that they love it, I thought that's a problem. When you Google suburbia is, <laughs> this is also interesting. <laughs> this is not me. This is Google's autobots helpfully trying to suggest what many other people have already searched for to make it easier. Suburbia is hell. Suburbia is dead. Suburbia is boring. Suburbia is where the developer build bulldozes. So, um, but enough with the problem. So the, the good news out there is that there are, there's a race to create all these kinds of solutions to these problems, both in cities but also in suburbs. Builders and developers around the country have realized that there's a real need and more importantly a market for uh, more urbanized communities in the suburbs, places where there's a lively main street where people can gather, where you can get that cliche, good cup of coffee, and all that good kind of stuff. This is a community called Kentlands. It's in Gaithersburg, Maryland. It's a suburb about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. And this was a community that was very carefully designed to bring elements of urbanism into the suburbs. It's got townhouses and row houses. It's got regular single family houses too. It has a lot of places to gather in a little downtown. Uh, and this has been a real financial success since it opened in 1993. A lot of people say, or some people say that it's almost as if you took Georgetown and airlifted it and dropped it into the middle of suburbia, and that's kind of what it feels like. But for a long time, there just weren't that many places like this. You could really, um, when it came to where you wanted to live in this country, you could have city or suburb and very little in between. But that's what's all starting to change right now. So this is a community outside of Chicago in Libertyville, Illinois. Uh, the developer here used to build Sprawl, and he just decided a couple years ago that people might want something more like this instead. It's basically 26 single family houses, but they're really close together. They're built right next to the street. Um, it's, you can't see here, but it's about 100 yards away from a really packed, very old school main street. So there's tons of stuff to do. There's bars that are open until 3 a.m. And this community went, op it opened up in the middle of the financial crisis. And within 18 months, he had sold all the homes. The local press called it an aberration. Uh, some of this building is happening right here in the Philadelphia suburbs. Um, a company called Arcadia uh, is doing some developing. This is in Narberth, but it's got um, communities in, in various places in this area. 
Toll Brothers is in on this too. The very biggest builders are noticing this trend and trying to deliver these things for people to make their lives better. Um, this is in Bucks County. Many of these communities are opening on the ashes of uh, old shopping malls, which um, shopping malls that are either dead or dying. There's a website that tracks them these days. It's called deadmalls.com. We have a lot of them. <laughs> So this is in Lakewood, Colorado, where there used to be a massive mall with a J.C. Penney and a Montgomery Ward. Now there's a community of 1,100 apartments and houses and condos and restaurants, cafes, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Interestingly, right near, in media near where I grew up, the Granite Run Mall was just purchased by Toll Brothers to do something, in theory, uh, very similar to that. Th that's a dead mall, in case you want to know. <laughs> Uh, you can really tell the word, the void that these the developers are trying to fill in the words and phrases they use when they market these new places. They ask, have you met your neighbors? We'll give that to you. Um, they, they tout that you can leave the car keys at home, and they, they advertise their inviting Main Street atmosphere. These are things that they are marketing the same way they would have marketed a three-story foyer not that long ago. This is Bradley Cooper from Silver Linings Playbook, because I always think any presentation benefits from a slide of Bradley Cooper. But, <laughs> but this is here because this movie, as, as many of you probably know, was shot in part in Drexel Hill, which is a really great example of what all of these builders are trying to replicate. They're trying to build communities the way we used to build them. And places like Drexel Hill have that different kind of DNA and that different kind of blueprint. Um, you could call it an urban burb or a silver linings playbook burb. These kinds of older places are really well positioned for the future. A couple months ago, the New York Times did an article on this very trend and said that these kinds of suburbs, the old original vintage suburbs, are going to be very popular, especially with millennials. And who they, they like to be near where the action is, and that's what these communities offer. So it called them hipsterbia, which is a phrase I really like. <laughs> So this is Media, Pennsylvania, my hometown, and it really is a hipsterbia, is where I grew up. It has all these kinds of ingredients that you don't really see in suburbs anymore. It has a trolley that people actually use to get to work each day. It has a really lively and packed uh, Main Street. It's called State Street. It has a restored 1927 theater. Uh, this is Media on Wednesday nights in the summertime when the town holds Dining Under the Stars. They close the Main Street to traffic and all the restaurants serve dinner, and hundreds and hundreds of people come to this. So this is not what conventional suburbia looks like on Wednesday nights in the summertime, but it is what urban burbs can look like on Wednesday nights in the summertime, and this is what people want. Philadelphia is, we're spoiled here with these kinds of communities. The old railroad suburbs, I mean, basically almost originated in Philadelphia, so there's tons of them. Bryn Mawr, this is Narberth. Uh, this is Westchester. You can kind of chart where the urban burbs are by, by seeing where uh, Iron Hill Brewery opens. <laughs> <laughs> this is Swarthmore, near and dear to my heart, next town over. This is Chestnut Hill, which is in the city, but this might be the ultimate kind of urban burb, the real, the real ideal. This urbanization trend has also been alive and well in our cities, which are just newly resplendent, under, undergoing the kind of renaissance that you really only see once a century. Philadelphia is in many ways a laboratory of that. This is Rittenhouse Square. More families are staying here than ever before. The growth from the 2010 census was uh, really impressive. All you need to do is travel to East Passyunk, where all the new hot restaurants are opening to see proof of this trend. We have uh, Sam Sherman, the developer, behind all that right here. <laughs> Um, this is also happening in New York City and many other cities. So I work at Fortune Magazine, and we always like to chart the moves of big business when we look at where things are going and where people are moving. And sure enough, all of these suburban icons, Target, Walgreen, Walmart, Michael's Craft Store, they're all opening up smaller versions of themselves so that they can squeeze into these cities and be where all the action is. Oops. One of the most interesting urban, suburban to urban migrations, I think, is that of Toll Brothers, which is, of course, a local company right here in, Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area. The pioneer of the big luxury suburban mega home, uh, Toll Brothers is now doing all different kinds of things that you may not realize. This is a Toll Brothers building in Dumbo, which is a very industrial chic neighborhood in Brooklyn in New York City. This building is very chic and fits with the neighborhood. It has reclaimed wood from the Coney Island boardwalk in the lobby and a zen garden on the roof and loft apartments. It sold out within a year or two with prices at from 400000 to $2 million. This is another Toll Brothers building 
uh, that's going to change the lower Manhattan skyline when it's done. It's 40 stories, and the apartments will be priced from 1 million to 10 million. Toll Brothers has about 30 buildings in New York City now that are either open or in the works. It's got a lot here in Philadelphia as well. This change is really emblematic of what's happening across our broader landscape. I talked to the CEO of Toll Brothers, Doug Yearly, and he told me that he never thought they would be building on Park Avenue South. He never thought they would have a penthouse for sale for $20 million in New York City. But they do, and that's emblematic of what's happening in our broader landscape. <clears throat> Jane Jacobs, the legendary urbanist, a long time ago said that the suburbs would one day go out of fashion. It's kind of funny to think of suburbs that way, like shoulder pads or Uggs or something like that. But it's not overstating things to say that that's actually what's happening here. I know that that's a controversial thing to say, but it's not really the end of the suburbs. It's really the beginning of something new, and that is more options. For so long, we had this sort of binary landscape when it came to the most important decision we all make, which is how and where we choose to live. You could have a city or you could have a suburb. So now there's all these things in between. You have a whole menu. You can still have a big house in the suburbs if you want one. There will still be a market for that. I still wear my Uggs. <laughs> not, my, not shoulder pads. <laughs> but you can also have all these other things. You can have an old school hipsterbia suburb. You can have a brand new urban burb. You can have a house in a family friendly city. It's this multiple choice, choose your own adventure housing market that has been missing from our landscape so long. So really, this is actually very good news for everybody. These changes are real. They mean the arrival of a new American dream, or more specifically, multiple American dreams for multiple American dreamers. And they're out there. They're happening now. So I urge you all to go back to your communities and look at the changes that are happening around you. If you don't see them now, you're going to see them soon, because they're coming to a neighborhood near you. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.